Excellent. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, what I want to do now is um, introduce you to Stan Collins. Um, he's worked in the suicide prevention field for over 20 years and is the co-founder of the Directing Change Program and Film Contest. Uh, Stan will introduce some best practices for responding to deaths by suicide in a school setting, uh, principles for identifying suicide risk among children and youth, and also key components for effectively and appropriately responding to suicide risk. And then he's going to rejoin us in the second part of his presentation uh, to close out today's event and help us identify next steps we can take using the strategies that you learned about today. Stan is a national leader in developing and implementing suicide prevention curriculum and strategies. He's part of the California Department of Education's work group that developed the model policy for youth suicide prevention uh, in response to recent legislation. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Stan. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. All right, wonderful. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the honor to be here and present to you. Uh, before I begin, a little context and background. Uh, one is that uh, I was so impressed with Dr. Goldman Miller. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation and setting the stage for the day. And thank you also for concluding that there is hope. A lot of times when it comes to suicide prevention, fear immediately takes hold. And we worry so much about doing the wrong thing that we forget that there is a right thing or there's options of right things. And there is blueprints and there are people who have worked tires, tirelessly in this field uh, for decades to give us some guidance on what to do. And I'm hoping to impart not just knowledge today with you, uh, but also a comfort and uh, embracing your own abilities that every one of us has a role to play in suicide prevention. I'll speak more to you as an individual later. Uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna be speaking more to at a system level. Uh, with that though, I want to also acknowledge uh, you a couple of things. Number one is that today is filled with content around suicide prevention. And although many of your professional and personal lives have been touched by suicide in one way or another, it's not often that many of you uh, spend an entire day talking about this subject. So I do want to echo this idea of self-care. Um, as we're talking throughout the day, if you need to take an emotional break, uh, the day is filled with brain breaks, but just know that, um, that you know, I will not take any disrespect if, if at any time you need to take a step away and that when the day is concluded, I really hope that you will go and uh, focus on, on hope and focus on love. And really that although we are talking about a tragedy, or tragedies throughout the day, that today is really about hope and about prevention, about life. Um, I also want to acknowledge and just give an activation warning that uh, I will be sharing a little bit of a personal story of loss. I'm sure I'm not the only person today who has been impacted by suicide loss. And so I just wanted to put that out there for any of the other loss survivors. Uh, my hearts are with you and thank you for being here today. Uh, so with that, I'm actually not going to run through my slides yet. Um, what I want to do is uh, start with a personal story. Uh, and before I do that, actually, uh, I want to just acknowledge a little bit of my background. Um, I, as mentioned, I'm the co-founder of the Directing Change Program and Film Contest. I'll be speaking more about that program this afternoon. Uh, the forward-facing part is a youth mental health suicide prevention program based around film creation. Uh, but on the back end, we provide a lot of support in partnership with offices of education and the Department of Education, uh, two districts in comprehensive suicide prevention. But instead of leaving that picture of my, uh, that giant picture of me on the screen. I wanted to, as I tell this story to you, or we can even for the first few minutes, I even take down the slides. Uh, but this, this quote here is my guiding principle when it comes to suicide prevention, that suicide prevention and intervention require constant vigilance. As we have seen with the mandates that have come down from the state, as we know from our interactions with youth, that youth, and, and as also as we heard from the data just now, it's not the tra just the tragedy of youth death, it is the travesty of how many youth are impacted by suicide ideation, the, the overwhelming pain that leads to those thoughts of suicide. But I wanna to start today with sharing my personal experience with suicide. I mentioned I'm a loss survivor and I wanna set the stage with that story. I grew up in San Diego and I grew up in Poway, California, actually graduated from Poway High School. And growing up, my older brother had a best friend who had a younger brother. So whenever our brothers would go to the beach or go to the movies, we have what I call an arranged friendship where our moms would force us into the back seat 
and we would tag along with our brothers and we would go and we would hang out. And uh, his name is Jesse, my best friend's, my brother's best friend's little brother is named Jesse. And uh, over time, uh, I grew on Jesse, but to start off, Jesse was a year older than me. And Jesse, looking back, was much cooler than me. He was kind of a skater, ran with a rough crowd. Uh, being a year older than me, I thought he had the entire world figured out. And uh, I imagine to him, I was probably like that little puppy that just kept running over and he pushed me away and I'd run back and he pushed me away again. And eventually one day he decided I could stay and he took me under his wing, which was a huge lift to me going into my freshman year in high school because my freshman year in high school, I was 100 pounds dripping wet. I was a self-proclaimed nerd. I was going to Comic-Con way before Comic-Con was cool. I was, you know, in advanced classes with juniors and seniors, but I was blessed in that my fourth period geometry class, I, I got to sit right next to Jesse. We had the same class together. So there was one period throughout the day where I knew that I would be safe, that I could go and me and Jesse would spend an hour together. We would learn some geometry. From there, it was lunchtime, a few more classes in the day and, and the day was pretty much over. But one day I came home from practice and I was walking down the hallway of my house and my older brother was coming towards me and he had tears in his eyes. And me and my brother are very different people on the emotional spectrum. Uh, he went into law enforcement, he followed in my mother's and father's footsteps. And so uh, he, he is somebody who kind of represses his emotions. He's gotten better over the years. Uh, I, on the other hand, have all, am and always have been the person who cries at Disney movies and Hallmark cards. And so having this kind of like, you know, this change in between our, our emotional behaviors when I saw my brother with tears in his eyes, I knew immediately, even as a 14 year old boy, that something bad had happened. And I went up to him and I asked him what was going on. And I'll never forget what he said and how he said it when he told me that Jesse had taken his life, that he had died by suicide. And I remember the weight of the world hitting me with those words. I remember stumbling back until I hit the wall. I remember collapsing as I slid my head, as I slid my back down and put my head in between my knees and just cried for hours. And for those other lost survivors out there, you know it is every emotion that there is to feel. It is, it is pain, it is sadness, it is regret and grief and shame, thinking about what I could have done differently, what if I could have saved them. Uh, an emotion we as lost survivors don't talk a lot about is anger. I was actually mad at Jesse, thinking how could he take his friendship away from me? He was so important to me. And through all of these emotions, uh, not knowing what to do with them. And that night I eventually went to bed cried myself to sleep. And I was, as I went to school the next day, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't really sure. I remember my mom was there making breakfast and she told me that I could take the day off from school and just stay. She had taken the day off from work. She was planning to stay home with me, but I was determined to go to school. And I, I didn't really know why. And I went through the first three periods of the day in this weird fog. And as I walked up to the, the trailer towards the back of the school where our geometry class was, and I remember this so vividly. I remember the sounds of that my feet, those that loud sound that those feet make on those temporary trailers. And I remember as I reached for the handle to open the door, I remember pausing for just a moment. And that's when I realized I came to school because there was a big part of me that wished and hoped with every part of my being that when I opened that door, that Jessica was gonna be sitting there, that my friend was gonna be there and this was all gonna be a bad dream and I could go on with my life as normal. And instead what happened is I opened up the door and I saw his empty desk and it all came crashing down. All the reality of the pain situation that Jesse is no longer here hit me. Because up until that point in the day, I saw, aside from my mother's quick conversation, no one had really talked about it. There was whispers and there was, there was silence, but there was no acknowledgement of what had happened. And so I went into the room, I sat in my desk, and the teacher didn't know what to do. He was a geometry teacher. He hadn't been prepped that morning on what to say to the students. There was no counsel in the room. And so he started to do business as normal and he went through roll call. And there was that awkward moment when he had to skip over the roll call because um, he acknowledged that he shouldn't say Jesse's name. He knew that Jesse was gone. And he started to teach geometry and a few minutes into class, there was an announcement over the intercom. And our principal came over and he's, you know, over the intercom and he said that we had lost a student. And I remember I heard a, a sound of crying in the back corner of the room and a girl got up from her seat, just overcome with emotion and, and just bolted out the room and slammed the door. And there was this, you know, what felt like an eternity, just these awkward moments of not sure 
not knowing what to do. And Mr. Sked, you know, bless him for doing his best. He realized that today was not the day we're gonna talk about geometry. Nobody is here is, is even capable of learning about math today. And as a geometry teacher with no preparation, he led us into some sort of a conversation about our emotions and let us just express what was going on. And it was the only time throughout this entire period that we had space created for us to just try to understand what this meant. You know, for me, this was the first time that I'd really lost anyone. Definitely the first time that I had lost a friend. And I remember being so frustrated thinking that I had been talked to about sex, drugs, rock and roll, and all the way that kids can die. And yet the one way in which my friend died, no one ever spoke to. And unfortunately, there was not really any follow-up after that. There was no support groups. There was no crisis response. Now, granted, this was in the mid-90s, uh, but it's looking back kind of in the dark ages as far as suicide prevention or postvention is concerned. There was no opportunity to talk. There was no reminder about referrals if you need to talk to somebody. There was no sharing of crisis resources. And so I want to pause the story there, and I want to also encourage you to know that there is a, a brighter second half of the story that I'll get to in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, if we could go ahead and share the slides again, what I want to start with today. Is it... Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for pulling those up. And I think I have control. Let me see if this works. It does. Um, Yeah, and actually the post mention slides have been moved around. These are ordered differently. So I'm a little confused. I'm gonna pause there and think for just one second. Um, and uh, Laura, I apologize for this awkward pausing moment. There we go, thank you. That's it, that's what we're looking for. Um, great, so what I wanna do now is Postvention is an area of suicide prevention under the umbrella of suicide prevention because postvention is prevention in which it often gets neglected. We know, especially from the mandate, we need to do prevention. We know we need to do a better job at identifying and intervening with youth, but postvention is something that often gets left off the table until we need it. And unfortunately, as Monica addressed earlier with the postvention response team, when we're in that moment of crisis response, that is the worst time for us to try to figure out what is the plan and what direction are we going to go. So I want to start by actually speaking to postvention, and then I'll come back to prevention and intervention. And to start uh, to kick off postvention, I actually want to share just a couple practical considerations and suggestions that I hope you'll take to heart in terms of uh, being effective in a postvention response. Because one of the things I remember looking back to to that geometry class, one of the hardest parts about the next few weeks, the next few months, was that I still was sitting next to my best friend's empty desk. And so I honestly don't know if I learned anything else about geometry for the rest of that semester, because every day I sat there staring at his desk, wondering what I could have done, what I could have said, what if something would have gone differently? And so one of the, the first steps to look at, and not immediately, you know, give kids time to process, there probably was some healing that came from being associated with that desk. But at some point when the time is right, rearranging the seating chart, not just, you know, switching, you know, what student's sitting in what seat, because no kid wants to sit in the desk of the dead kid, right? So actually rearranging the seating chart. So if you're theater style, move to circle. If you're circle, move to theater. I've also heard of teachers coming in over the weekend to support the teachers who lost that student uh, and redecorating the room, just bringing a different kind of vibe and, and environment to the students and to the educator. Another thing is I think about how powerful it would have been and supported both to us and to our teacher, Mr. Sked, to have a counselor in the room to lead that conversation, to help him make that statement. And a lot of times what schools will do is they will have a counselor shadow that student's schedule for one day. But to be honest with you, looking back at that one day, everything was just a mess. And it's after day two or day three, day four, that you start to see who's gonna sink and swim. So not just shadowing the student's schedule, but shadowing it for multiple days. Another part is that we also have to be prepared that each of us will be impacted by student death in different ways. Some of us have a stronger connection to different students. And so a protocol can't be tied to an individual. It needs to really be tied to the position and there always needs to be a backup because we always need to look at staff wellness first and foremost, because if our staff is not well, our students will not be well. And we need to give space for that staff member to be able to say, I just can't do this right now. 
Uh, we also need to think about cultural considerations for families. Some languages don't even have a word for suicide. Uh, some families will not want to talk about this. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the culture, bringing in a cultural broker or a family member to help guide your conversation and your supports. Another suggestion that I have for you is that oftentimes when we have a suicide, we give every resource in the world. We give every hotline, every warm line, every support line. But what I say is that when we give every resource, we actually give no resource. And if you don't believe me, try to look for a mental health professional on your insurance carrier's website and you will see a list of names and you're just picking things out of a hat. So really trying to identify what are your key resources. I recommend the National Lifeline, Crisis Text Line, and Teen Line, which is a phenomenal resource I'll speak to in a little bit. And perhaps one of the best suggestions I've ever heard is that oftentimes when I work with staff in a postvention setting, the staff on campus, especially the staff who had that individual, are so impassioned to be there for others that they will, they will push through for the, the coming weeks. But after about a two or three week period, the staff momentum, their energy start to fall off. And so one of the best ways to support staff in that, in that situation is instead of offering the teacher, you know, for example, my geometry teacher, a substitute, instead ask him, hey, who's your, who's your best friend? Who's your buddy? Who's your partner on campus? And having a substitute come in and backfill for that other buddy teacher and have that buddy teacher come in and co-facilitate uh, with that teacher so that they have that support. So in the days when they need to step away for a few moments, they know that they're not letting their kids down, that they are gonna be there for support. And in general, just having substitutes on campus um, or, or just available to support. Now, uh, this of course is some of this applies to the in-person setting, which we're all kind of headed back towards. And, uh, but many of these suggestions still apply to the, the virtual setting. Another step that often gets missed is that staff meeting to prepare them for these conversations with you, to remind them of the resources available and how to refer students. Uh, one of the situations though, is if we call a staff meeting at 6.30, some folks may not have childcare at that time or uh, security staff, bus drivers, food service workers, custodial staff, you know, the, the, the classified staff may not be available. So if possible, uh, staggering debriefing meetings uh, or prep meetings with the staff throughout the day so that everyone has an opportunity to participate, as well as making sure that you have a debrief meeting afterwards. Uh, when talking to parents who have lost a child to suicide, one of the most traumatic experiences that they have is the day after losing their child to suicide is they get a, a robo call from the school attendance system saying that their child is absent. Uh, immediately identifying somebody, assigning somebody to remove their child from the absentee system. And also if possible, any state testing or any results that may be mailed to that child, uh, please at, you know, reaching out to the family at some point and letting them know that um, you've requested that those, those responses be mailed to the school. And when you receive them, you will contact the family to see if they're ready. Because uh, again, receiving mail for your child can be an extremely traumatic situation for those parents. Also, just putting some talking points together. This afternoon, I'm going to speak to messaging and how we message safely and effectively about suicide impacts not just prevention and postvention, but intervention. And so that's another important step. So we'll really be digging into that this afternoon. And then finally, this is just, again, one, one last practical suggestion is securing that file. Whether staff or students, people can get curious and people can get nosy. Uh, reaching in, grabbing any paperwork on that student and securing it in a safe place in the principal's office, the head counselor's office, school psychologist. So again, those are just some practical suggestions that often get overlooked when we're looking at the big picture of postvention. And what I wanna do now is uh, jump into just some general guidance about postvention. I also wanna give a shout out to Sergio or Laura uh, for the, the, the quick fix on the slides, I apologize for that, that pause there earlier. So first let's start off, what is postvention? This may be a word that you're not familiar with. So postvention refers to steps that are taken in response to a suicide death. Some will also uh, include responses to a suicide attempt in this, uh, but really it's talking about suicide deaths. One of the most important things as I highlighted earlier or hinted at earlier is that timing is critical. Uh, after a suicide occurs is not the time to start to develop a postvention plan. You need to have all your ducks in a row so that immediately once you're notified, everybody knows their role, you can check in with your staff and you can get moving. Uh, with that, why postvention? The reality is that schools are often unsure how to respond. And what we 
instinctually do in a school setting to respond to suicide death can actually increase risk among youth. So we want to be very careful about the steps and actions that we take. Um, what we also know is that certain, you know, responses from the school can actually decrease risk. I think back to my experience of how powerful it would have been to have a healthy healing, you know, conversation in that classroom with all my other classmates or know that I could go up to the library and meet in a support group or with a counselor to just process what it is that's going on. We also need to acknowledge that, again, not only is this the first time that many youth will have dealt with suicide, it's oftentimes the first time they will have dealt with death. And so we need to be mindful that how youth respond to that first death is often going to shape how they respond to subsequent deaths down the road. So when we talk about suicide bereavement, a few of the, the things that we want to be aware of is the shame and guilt as I address, what could I have done? Could I have done something differently? Uh, oftentimes folks who have had uh, relationship issues, uh, that partner is, is really worried about, is this my fault? Uh, there's a sense of shock or disbelief. A lot of times we're so focused on the youth who are crumbling in the immediate that for many youth, the, the, real, the reality that this death has occurred will not sink in for, for months sometimes. And so remaining vigilant in the coming months. Oftentimes administrators have this mentality of we need to get back to normal. And it's an under, we need to understand that this is, it's not getting back to normal, it's establishing a new normal that incorporates space for youth to experience that bereavement. So based on my experience, I would fall into that smallest circle of suicide bereaved long-term. And we are all gonna be impacted in different ways. And I'll talk in just a moment about how to identify other youth who may be impacted as well. So with that, um, what are we trying to do when we're talking about postvention? We're trying to assist that grief process. Uh, one of the things that we need to do also is provide accurate information. A lot of times we're concerned or confused about what information is appropriate to share. Uh, you know, what information should we not share? What, what is, is dangerous? And so what oftentimes happens when schools are communicating to the students or to the larger community is they get very formal and almost robotic in their responses. And it's okay to bring heart to these conversations. You and your staff and everyone in that community is grieving right now. It's okay to acknowledge that. But we will only want to provide the amount of information that is needed to keep other youth safe, to acknowledge the death. And we'll talk a little bit about whether or not we can talk about suicide in this situation. One of the other things we want to do is we want to get our team together and identify who may be at increased risk after exposure to this death. Earlier, we heard about suicide contagion and suicide risk. So we want to look at and spread a wide net of who might be impacted by this suicide. Now, a lot of times immediately following a suicide death, schools want to jump in, hey, we got to educate our staff, we got to educate our youth. But I would caution you in, in immediately implementing suicide prevention efforts, because what that can do is, is what we call survivor guilt or survivor grief. And, um, you know, there is a time and a place to incorporate that prevention, but not immediately falling to death. I'm sorry, apologies. All right, so a few key elements. And again, I could spend all day talking to you about this and through directing change, we do offer an all day training on post pension to really do a deep dive. But number one, we wanna support the survivors. We wanna mitigate and reduce the trauma that all those who have been impacted by the suicide death and also allowing space for those who weren't really impacted or didn't know the student. We don't wanna inadvertently force trauma on them by allowing memorials. And I'll speak to memorials in a second. Again, we wanna provide that timely and accurate information. We wanna get that information out as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, Waiting two or three days uh, can do a lot of damage in that interim uh, for those youth who have been impacted and the staff who have been impacted. Uh, we also want to make sure we're having appropriate messaging. Again, we'll focus on messaging later this afternoon. And one of the, the steps that gets skipped the most is that debrief session. Once we survive the trauma, the weeks following a suicide death, most of us just wanna sweep it under a rug, hide it in a closet and hope we never have to go through that again. But what I see from the schools who have the, the most effective post pension responses is that they took time following a previous suicide or someone was part of a team previously that took time to look at and say, what, what did we do right? What could we have done better? But the debrief part is a huge component of the postvention plan. I wanna share with you this resource 
This is from the SAMHSA toolkit and I'll share with you resources in just a moment. The SAMHSA toolkit, Preventing Suicide, a toolkit for schools, chapter three is on postvention. And I pulled this checklist from this, if nothing else, sometime this month, in the month of March or this week, uh, and I can, I'm happy to send this out. If your school at a minimum completes this checklist at each school site, you will at least be ahead of the game if you ever have to respond to a suicide. And one thing you'll notice that it, it asks for you to incorporate uh, contact information and also information on the backup. And it's kind of the 17 key steps or, or big buckets that you need to utilize following a suicide death. So again, we'll share this resource out, uh, but at a minimum, please complete this by the end of the month. All right, so just a couple of things to consider in that staff planning session. One of the things that I say to the principal when I first walk onto a campus after suicide is they are so focused on their youth and I encourage them to take a step back and look at their staff. Ultimately, as we heard earlier, suicide deaths occur more in the middle age years than they do at the younger ages. And although contagion is, is a thing, uh, I'm actually more concerned about the staff. Because again, if the staff is not well, the students will not be well. So encouraging to ventilate their feelings, to, you know, to talk about. They may be sad, they may be angry. Uh, giving them some sense of normalcy to whatever grief they're feeling or not feeling. Some of the, your staff may not have known the child. Some of your staff may not have known the child but are so empathetic that they are just crushed by the idea that a child can be in so much pain. We want to encourage, uh, discourage attempts to romanticize suicide. We, don't, we want to avoid statements that say at least they're no longer in pain or you know, one of the most horrific examples I've heard is a teacher utilizing this opportunity to read Romeo and Juliet, which is perhaps the most romanticized form of suicide. So we want to give them accurate information. We want to give them talking points. And most importantly, we want to give them a step and a process to identify and refer youth who they're concerned about. And these may be youth who had no connection to that child, but we're going to speak to that in just a moment. Also, so when we're talking about those who are impacted by youth. Of course, we immediately think of that friend circle, or like I said, the ex-partners of that individual or the current partner of that individual, teammates, club sports, uh, other out, out of school activities. Uh, but we also want to spread a wider net for youth who have no direct connection with that child. Think about youth who may have previously had suicide ideation or suicide attempt, youth who have recently lost a loved one to suicide and are still in a grieving process. Um, you know, I think back to some of my friends in high school, and I had different friends in school than out of school. So one of my best friends would have never been on that list of top friends uh, that the school would check into. So casting a wide net, also talking to the parents, talking to the students' friends, and saying, who else should we check in with? But you really want to cast a wide net. I would also encourage you to think ahead of time of what is going to be your system to collect these names. Immediately, many schools will say, well, we'll create a Google Doc, right? Then everybody has access to it. And we can put all the names there and we'll start working through that Google Doc and check in with kids. But if everybody has access to it, the risk is that others will get access to it. And that list might get, you know, in the hands of a student. Now they're posting it on Instagram. Or in a legal setting, let's say you identify 50 students. And as you check in with student 49, student 50 makes a suicide attempt. Um, that kind of documentation may be admissible in court. And so you really want to think through what is going to be our process to track students who may be impacted. And of course, as I said with the debrief, there's some long-term considerations. You may have a child at your high school who died by suicide, but they may have siblings at the middle school, the elementary school, at the local college, or at a college away. Um, so looking and realizing that your whole community is in a post pension response. Being prepared and looking at your district policies for how, how do you respond or acknowledge during graduation or yearbooks. I remember fighting tooth and nail to get a, a yearbook page for Jesse the year that he died. And at the time they just said no, but without explanation. Um, so there's gonna be times where you have to tell your youth, no, we can't do that. But the, please, please, please understand that your youth are smarter than we give them credit for. And if you can at least substantiate why uh, they can't do a thing or can't memorialize their child. Another area we have to be cognizant of now is social media. Uh, the school may be, not be talking about suicide, but the community is, the youth are, and it can spread like wildfire. So many times you're gonna have youth come forward and say, hey, we wanna do something, what can we do? Empower those youth, give them gatekeeper training on suicide prevention and say, hey, we need you to be our eyes and ears out there on social media. If you hear about somebody posting about suicide, here's some sample posts you can use, you can refer back. Uh, here, you know, here's a, 
it's a template post you can use to remind people they can check in with their school counselor to talk to a trusted adult or to post about the crisis text line. Also putting out information that every major social media platform has mechanisms for reporting uh, posts that are related to suicide. So sharing this type of information on a regular basis is really important. One of the issues also comes up when, it, when we start to talk about memorials. You know, the impromptu memorials with the flowers and the teddy bears and the notes for students. Um, now, you can't just simply prevent all memorials. You can't just tell kids not to process their grief. But one of the creative suggestions I heard is instead of it being in the middle of the quad, one school I worked with said, we're gonna set it up in the counseling office so that the students are at least coming to a safe place where they can process it. Also monitoring who's, who's coming, who, what are they putting? You know, I remember meeting, reading notes from students they would put on a memorial that say, we'll be back together soon. Well, as soon mean in 50, 60 years when you've lived a full life or as soon tomorrow. So checking in. Also, we run into the issue of what to do with this memorial after days and weeks have gone by. We don't want to just give the sense that it's here one day and it's gone the next and everything's been thrown in the trash. So a creative solution is after an uh, impromptu memorial has been set up to put a little sign and say on this date, you know, probably a couple weeks out or after the memorial service, we're going to take the items that are left here and we're going to offer them to the family. So if you have any items you've left, please come by and gather them. Otherwise, they will be given to the family. So you're acknowledging that the youth have processed their grief, and you're also acknowledging and, and doing something beautiful for the family about the memories and the gifts that were uh, you know, provided for their child. Now, one of the, the trickiest situations is how do we communicate about this to the larger community? I, and I see a post there. Uh, someone's giving you some sample templates. So various toolkits have sample temp, uh, templates for these letters. Uh, when it's been ruled a suicide, that as difficult as all of this is, that is probably the easiest situation to navigate. Um, but what happens when the death is unconfirmed? Or what if the family comes to you and say, I never want you to, to use my child's name and the word suicide in the same sentence? That puts us in a tough place. But what I would say is that our responsibility at that point, as much as we want to respect the family, is to the safety of other youth. And so a letter and the templates read something like this. With, it's with sad hearts that we inform you that we have lost one, or, one of our students. We will be providing supports on campus. In the next paragraph, so you have not confirmed that the death was a suicide, in the following paragraph, you say, since the issue of suicide has been brought up, we wanted to take a moment and provide you with some resources and education about suicide. So you're respecting the family's wishes, but you're not utilizing that or, or letting that overcompensate for your ability to communicate suicide. HIPAA and FERPA are important things and they apply, uh, but ultimately we have to look at, or to some degree, not after someone has died, but we have to, again, our responsibility is the youth, the safety of the youth who are still here. I mentioned the staff debrief and I'm kind of getting behind on time, so I wanna skip over this a little bit. The most important part is just that you're debriefing with your staff, you're taking time to prep them. So as, as we're kind of transitioning out of the, the post pension phase, a couple things that I would ask you is what is suicide when a suicide occurs in your community or if a suicide occurred in your community, what does it look like right now? What is the response? Are you prepared? Is your district prepared? Does your district support the response that you would want to make? Does your district, do you have a district policy on permanent memorials or permanent, you know, how to deal with graduation? Because you in that counseling role or whatever your support role may be, you need to be able to point to that policy and say, this is not just something I'm deciding, this is district policy. What is that survivor experience? Are you aware of survivor support, uh, survivors of suicide loss support groups in your community? And again, just playing that, that kind of mind game of what would it look like if it were to happen is one of the best places to start in implementing and expanding postvention. All right, so as we noted earlier, we do know what can also help to prevent suicide. And I wanna, I wanna pause here for just a second. I'll leave this slide up or we can take it down for a second because I wanna share the second part of the story that shares a little bit of light to this conversation. So a few years later, my senior year in high school, I mentioned my family's in law enforcement and my father invited me to come to a presentation from the Yellow Ribbon Suicide Prevention Program. And he asked me, as a youth who has experienced suicide loss, as a youth who's involved in link crew and peer counseling, would you come check out this presentation and just give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, should the police department endorse this program? And to be honest with you, I was just so excited by the name. 
the Yellow Ribbon Suicide Prevention Program. I was 17 years old. I'd already lost a friend to suicide. And this was the first time in my life that I heard suicide and prevention attached to each other. And I went to the presentation and I felt, I walked away feeling so empowered, thinking, man, we really got to talk about this. More youth need to know what to look for, the warning signs, that it's okay to, to break a secret and tell a trusted adult that there's a, a phone number that I can call anytime, day or night, if I'm worried about a friend, if I'm having thoughts of suicide. And so I went to my principal the next day and I gave him a packet of information. And for those of you 30 and above, you'll appreciate this. I gave him a VHS tape with an eight minute video about the Yellow Ribbon Program. And I said, we got to do this program. And he said, okay, give me a few days and you know we'll talk about it. So I came back a few days later and I said, are we going to do it? He said, you know, I got really busy the last few days. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Come back in a few more days. So I came back a few days later and I got the same response. I came back a few days later and this, this little kind of, you know, dialogue and, and competition went on for months until finally I walked in his office at the right time. And I said, are we going to do this? And he looked at me and he said, look, you're a good kid. If you think this is something that the other students need, if you raise the money, we'll make it happen. So I worked with the local chapter and we raised the money and we flew the founders of the program, Dale and Dar Emmy, who had lost their son to suicide a few years prior. And we gathered everybody in the gymnasium to have this very intimate conversation about suicide. And I say that with a, a smirk and a grain of salt because uh, we know now that a gymnasium is not the appropriate forum to have a conversation about suicide. This should be in a small setting where youth have the opportunity to, to dialogue and ask questions. Because I think back, man, what if there was a child, there was almost certainly a student in that gymnasium at that time who was having thoughts of suicide and just had to bite their lip and hold on for 45 minutes during this presentation. But anyways, everybody has gathered. If you build it, they will come. The day has arrived. And right before they're about to present, the Emmys look at me and they say, hey, Stan, have you thought about what you're going to say today? And I froze and I freaked out. And I was like, wait, 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 this is your job. I raised the money. I got them here. This is now your song and dance. And they said, you know what? We really think your classmates would benefit from hearing from you. And I remembered that in my writing seminar class earlier that semester, I had written a poem in memory of my friend, Jesse. And it was a, before you ask if I'll share it, it was a very cheesy high school age poem where every line had the same amount of syllables and every line rhymed. Uh, but it was the first time that I had taken a moment to process the, the loss of Jesse. And so I dug it out of my backpack and I stood in front of my entire school my senior year and, uh, you know, just picture this. I'm standing in front of 3,000 students my senior year in high school and I'm reading poetry and I'm mortified thinking, you are such an idiot. You are such a fool. How could you think that this would ever make a difference? How could you think that the words that you share will ever matter to someone else? But I stumbled through the poem. I skipped practice that day. I went straight home. I went straight to bed and I wanted to pretend like that day never existed. And the next morning, as I was walking onto campus, the, the attendance lady had a window that faced the front of the campus. And as I was walking on, I saw her make eye contact with me from behind the window. And I saw her immediately turn around and walk out of the back of the building. And she starts making a beeline right for me. So now I was a pretty good kid, but I'm freaking out because the attendance lady is heat seeking me out from across campus. And she walks up to me and I'll never forget the words that she said when she handed me an envelope and she said, I have a gift for you. And I opened up the letter. I have it framed actually right over here. I'll show it to you this afternoon. But it was a letter from a girl named Sarah, one of my classmates. Now, I don't know who Sarah is. I don't know her last name. Uh, to this day, I'm still searching for Sarah. But in her letter, she went on to tell me that prior to the presentation of me sharing my poem, she had been thinking about suicide. And that what I said or what I read had inspired her to reach out for help. And that she had made copies of that poem and she had shared them with people and that she had posted it next to her bed and that she was gonna read it every morning to remind her of her reasons for living. Now I share this story with you because suicide can feel overwhelming. It can feel, we can feel like just a grain of sand in an ocean. How are we ever gonna make a difference? But I share that part of the story with you because that's what led me into this 20 year plus journey into suicide prevention. But most importantly, I share this with you so that hopefully you will never underestimate the role that you can have and helping someone find their reasons for living. As a 17 year old boy with no training in mental health, no training in suicide prevention, I was able to nudge someone towards life. Now I didn't convince her not to die. She found a reason 
to live. And that's a huge dichotomy that we have to understand is that I used to think that when someone was thinking about suicide, they wanted to die. And what I've come to understand is that it's not about wanting to die, it's about not knowing how to go on living. And again, our job is not to convince them not to die. Our job in that moment is to increase the hope. I believe firmly that when you reduce suicide down to its two most basic factors, it comes down to pain and hope. And in that moment, in that conversation, you're not trying to erase all the pain from their life or inject them with overwhelming hope. What you're hoping to do is turn the dials just a little bit. And if we can turn the dials a little bit today, then we can turn them a little bit more tomorrow. And so whether you are a teacher, a counselor, a custodian, a security worker, a principal, a parent, a volunteer, each of us can, can hold that space to jump in the mud with somebody and hold on to the hope when they don't see it. And one of the things I wanna remind you also is that when we are ever having a conversation with somebody about suicide prevention, it's easy to be distracted by the 99% of them that thinks that, that dying is the option. But if someone is still here with you, if they're still able to have this conversation with you, there is at least 1% of them that is ambivalent or not sure yet. And so try not to get distracted by the 99% and try to focus on that 1%, that 1% of them that might wanna live, that might believe that this pain will end. And I hope that that will give you more comfort and more confidence in those conversations, in those day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, so with that, if uh, we can go ahead and pull up the slides. Uh, just to confirm, I think I have about 20 minutes left. So if I can get a thumbs up or a quick chat or Laura, if you can send me a text. Yes, that is correct, Stan. All right, minutes. perfect. Uh, so with that, how do we not just hope that some kid's gonna read a poem in your gymnasium and convince the children to, to think a different route? Let's talk about what can be done. Number one is know the warning signs. We need everyone on a school campus, every adult and every youth to be aware of what are the warning signs? What should we be looking out for? And over the last, when I first got into suicide prevention, a lot of the work that we did was youth trainings. And only occasionally would we do a staff training if we were allowed to. And now it, the pendulum has swung so far the other way that we focus so much on staff, which is what we need to do. We need to make sure that if a youth is identified, the staff know the referrals, the, the staff member is trained to do an assessment, but we need to not lose sight that as much as we wanna think we have the finger on the pulse of our youth, our, our fellow youth know more about what's going on in each other's lives. We have to empower everybody to know the warning signs. We also have to empower them not to be afraid of the S word. A lot of people are scared to ask directly, are you thinking about suicide? There's still this pervasive myth that if you talk about suicide, you're gonna cause it to happen. And in my 20 years experience working in the field and the tens of thousands of conversations, I've had oftentimes with complete strangers, I have never once had any other reaction to asking the question, are you thinking about suicide, than a sense of relief. It's like a pressure valve gets released. And now suicide is not this monster inside their head. Suicide is something that we're talking about. It's not weird that you're having these thoughts. Let's just talk about suicide. The only way we will ever truly know if someone is having these thoughts is if we ask. Once someone has been identified that they're having thoughts of suicide, we need to, to, we need to work with them. We need to do a proper screening or assessment. We need to sit down with them and create a safety plan, empower them. I used to think that it was my job to prevent suicide in someone else's life. And what I've come to understand is that the only person who decides whether or not an individual lives or dies by suicide is that individual. And so a lot of the work in suicide prevention has been about hoping that there is a lifeguard there to save someone. And what I really try to focus on is, yes, we want those people there too, but first I wanna figure out how to teach that person how to swim against the rip current so that they recognize first when they are in distress and second, some of the things that they can do and third, what is their support network? What are their other options? Another component, and this might be news to you, is that we don't want to disconnect them with any mental health professional. One of the best steps that you can do in your district, in your community, is identify which mental health professionals have been trained specifically in suicide prevention and ongoing care. There are four specific modalities that have been effective in showing reductions in suicide ideation, uh, DBT, CBD for suicide, uh, CAMS, and I apologize, I forget the other one. Again, when you go on your insurance carrier website looking for a mental health professional, you'll see listings for, I specialize in anxiety, I specialize in, in uh, family issues or depression. And very rarely, if ever, do you find someone that says, I specialize in ongoing care for suicide. And so you wanna make sure you're not just connecting them to any mental health professional, 
but somebody who's really skilled and competent in this area. And one of the other things we need to do a much better job of is responding to youth in the least restrictive settings. There is a time and a place when a youth needs to be transported to a hospital. But when we do a better job of screening and assessment and figuring out who is low risk or passive risk versus who is actually acutely high risk, what we can start to do is stop putting youth in a low risk category through this traumatizing experience. Oftentimes that involves handcuffs, the back of a police car and being uh, you know, transported to a mental health facility. Many times that can actually increase risk. And again, I'm not saying that there aren't circumstances when a child absolutely needs to go to a hospital. But what we also know, and I hear this from hospital providers, is that oftentimes a hospital is prepared to respond to mental illness, not necessarily to respond to suicide ideation. And also, you know, that, that 72 hour window where a child may go to a hospital, their suicide ideation is not going to evaporate in that time. That 72 hours is really to help the family kind of get together, take a breath, and prepare for the next steps. So those are just some big buckets. Um, again, I could spend all day on each one of those buckets, but I'm just gonna skip through a few uh, quick highlights here. So when looking at suicide prevention, we need to be comprehensive in our approach because without one puzzle piece, the next one is gonna fall out of place. Uh, this is based on the Suicide Prevention Resource Centers, also known as SPRC's Comprehensive Approach to Suicide Prevention. But you see that it's everything from increasing help seeking, that upstream prevention, uh, responding appropriately to crisis, making sure that I get in the effective care that I talked about. Uh, just feeling connected can help prevent people from having some thoughts of suicide or acting on those thoughts. And as Dr. Goldman spoke to earlier, reducing access to lethal means, which can be a really intimidating place, but for, for schools to jump into. Uh, she already shared uh, data on suicide. Uh, so I wanna speak for just a moment about staff development and trainings. Now, there are a number of programs out there they vary in cost, they vary in efficacy, uh, they vary in, in culturally appropriateness for cultural appropriateness for your, your team. Uh, one of the things I would encourage you to do is not so much focus on this program is better than that program. Um, look at what is needed from your staff. Don't be afraid to get a focus group of your staff uh, to identify the right training program. But also understand that when it comes to a training on suicide prevention, it really comes down to the person in the room. Is the trainer competent? Can they answer the questions? Because it's when I do a, a gatekeeper training for school staff, again, it's not just about imparting knowledge, it's about imparting comfort and confidence with this issue to really empower people to understand that they can play a role in suicide prevention, that they don't need to have all the answers, they don't need to be a mental health professional, but they need to be there to identify and refer that student. Education code now says that proper training is, is to be delivered to all staff. Uh, it used to be seven through 12. Now it's across the age spectrum. We have seen increases, as was noted earlier, in younger youth on uh, suicide ideation. So of course, you're not going to walk into a third grade, third grade classroom and talk to those youth about suicide. But that third grade teacher should absolutely be prepared and understand that if they are seeing behavioral issues that signal distress, it's not that that kid may just be having a hard time. We need to understand that that may be associated with suicide risk. So with that, um, the, the CDC model policy recommends annual training. Now also be respectful of your staff. You're not gonna come and give them the same training year over year. Adapt it, revise it, make sure it's meeting the needs. And the most important part of that training is making sure they understand the referral process and how to move a child from identification to that screening and assessment. And again, we can't just rely all on our staff. They have a lot going on. We also need to empower students and parents. Uh, through my home district, Poway Unified, the community uh, created an effort called What I Wish My Parents Knew, which is basically a parent academy. And as the title suggests, what we did is we went to youth and we said, what do you want your parents to understand better? And mental health and suicide prevention are always at the top of that list, as well as communication, academic pressure. And so we host a semester, every semester we host a parent workshop where there's eight different breakouts that are offered on, on a repeated schedule. So that over a three or four year period, parents come once, you know, once a semester and they learn about academic pressures and they learn about social media and they learn about suicide. And through Directing Change, we partnered with them to create a toolkit. Uh, this is available on the Directing Change website and, and we would love to support you in implementing this in your district. We've also had a few applications of this in the virtual setting as well. And as far as youth engagement programs, again, there are a lot out there from 
uh, Yellow Ribbon that I mentioned earlier, to NAMI on campus, Bring Change to Mind, and a bunch of other programs. What I would encourage you to do before selecting a program is do some research, look at the programs, and then get a focus group of youth from all walks of life, not just your ASP kids and your peer counselors. Get some kids who are on your truancy list. Get some kids who are you know, at the high risk, in the high risk populations and say, which program would you identify with you and understand that one Band-Aid is not gonna cover every wound that we have, um, but get that youth input and that youth feedback. Um, I, I, and when we talk about at the, the elementary schools, a lot of schools are curious right now. Okay, so we, we kind of have an idea of how to prepare our middle school and high school kids, but how do we talk to our elementary school kids about suicide? And the reality is you probably don't. But also, you're probably already doing things that support suicide prevention at your younger ages. SEL has been shown to increase protective factors such as help seeking, asking for support, um, stress management. It's also been shown to reduce uh, uh, risk factors. There's something called the good behavior game that is done in second and third grade. They did a 20 year longitudinal study and what they found is that youth who participated in that pro project or program in second grade over this 20 year period had reduced incidence of suicide, reduced incidence of substance abuse. So there's a lot that we can do at those younger ages to prepare youth for, around suicide prevention that never says the S word. Um, I'm also getting a shout out. You're gonna hear more about NAMI on campus later as well. So again, diversity, NAMI on campus mixed with a training program, mixed with an after school program and mixed with uh, something like directing change, which again, I'll speak to later. So, okay, so now we've identified youth who are at risk, our staff have identified, they've been referred up, what do we do now? We also need to provide, and this is another big gap in districts, we need to make sure that there is staff on campus who not only are doing suicide risk screenings or assessments, but who have been properly trained in suicide risk assessment and screening. Uh, over the next coming months, you'll, I'll be providing information on a statewide project through, um, that will be funded to roll out trainings on how to conduct a proper risk screening. Uh, as well as safety planning, that's a key element. But one of the things we're trying to do in these moments is we're trying to identify that level of risk. Every kid who says the word suicide is not at high risk, again, does not need to go to the hospital. We need to do a better job of preparing our staff, training them uh, to understand what the difference is between passive and active suicide risk. And one of the ways you can assist in getting your students referred over to that individual is a sheet like this. Again, this is a resource we created through Directing Change. It's a quick reminder for your staff about warning signs, the questions to ask. And it's kind of small, but in that bottom right, what you'll see is a referral process. And you'll notice that it says the contact name and the contact phone number. When a student has been identified at risk of suicide, we don't want this to be an email that gets sent forward. This is a phone call. And the instructions clearly say, call the first person on the list. If they don't pick up, call the second person. If they don't pick up and you keep working down this list, immediately, not at the end of the day, not tomorrow, until you get the student referred over to get that risk assessment done today. And the short version is, when should we be uh, doing a suicide risk assessment? And really, any time that a student is showing warning signs of suicide, we need to conduct the assessment. We need to notify the parents, and there are certain situations where a parent may endanger the student further uh, if we contact parents, so having policies around that if there's issues of abuse or neglect. Um, and then making sure we make that connection as smooth as possible to those outside resources, having a list of professionals, mental health professionals who are competent. So again, when do we do this? When any time a student, a staff, a parent, an adult, a coach, whoever it is, is worried about a child, we need to get in there and confirm whether or not there's suicide ideation, planning, or these other parts. And again, I could spend all day talking to you about the risk assessment, but the one thing I would encourage you to do is to look back and ask after today and say, what are we doing to train our staff? If you're looking for a risk assessment tool, this is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. It's one of the most evidence-based tools out there. It's intended for non-mental health professionals. It runs through six kind of basic questions that work through thoughts, planning and intent, and then also a question about behavior, which is really important. And through that, it helps to identify, is this child in passive risk? In there, are they in high risk? So if you don't have a tool, uh, this is a tool that I would recommend using because one of the scariest things that I see out there is not just from school to school, but counselor to counselor or support staff to support staff are not using the same uh, risk assessment tool or risk screening tool. So providing training, having a uniform tool, 
and also making sure that safety planning is part of that. So again, um, there will be resources and trainings coming out down the way uh, to provide training opportunities on risk assessment, a, risk, a template risk assessment packet, as well as uh, safety planning and how to conduct a safety plan with a child. Another part of that effort and something we wanna be working towards is are we tracking? We've talked about data on deaths, attempts, self-reported data, uh, self-reported data on ideation, but one of the data points we're not collecting right now is how many risk assessments are being completed. This is not just a good idea for us to understand and monitor trends in suicide risk, but it's also very valuable information when we're seeking grants or funding to expand our suicide prevention efforts for them to see how big of a problem this really is. Another thing I encourage you, and again, I apologize that I'm, I don't have time to go into this, is exploring what are your reentry procedures for a child after a suicide attempt? What do you do to prepare the staff? Uh, what do you do to prepare the family, the student? Do you give them that safe outlet? Who's gonna be checking in with that child? Um, or after a hospitalization or just a few days off for mental health crisis, whatever that may be. So with that, I'm gonna close out just a few minutes with those resources, so get your cameras ready. Again, these slides will be available. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, by calling that number, you will be routed back to your local crisis center. We have seven across the state of California. I would also encourage you though, to get the direct number to that crisis center because when you call the National Lifeline, it routes you based on your area code, not on your geographic proximity. So sharing not just the Lifeline, but your local crisis line. Uh, crisis text line is more approachable to many youth. They feel more comfortable communicating in that space two separate organizations, but regardless, you will be connected to a competent, trained uh, individual who can support you. Another thing I wanna emphasize is these resources are not just for the person in crisis, they are for the person helping someone through a crisis. If you are preparing to have a conversation with someone, if you just had a conversation with someone, if you're at a school setting and for whatever reason, you're the only person there that day, you can contact your local crisis line and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is how the assessment or the screening turned out. What do you think I should do? Because this is what I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards. Another phenomenal resource is Teen Line. It's open from 6 to 10 p.m. every day of the week. This is a hotline or support line that is staffed by other teenagers who have received almost 100 hours of training. They're supervised by a mental health professional, uh, but it's one of the best kept secrets around the country is this support line for teens that is available every day through call or text. If you're not familiar, the Trevor Project is focused on supporting LGBTQ youth and young adults. Again, a crisis line or a text line. They also have Trevor Space, uh, just a phenomenal resource and a phenomenal program. I see what's the teen line again. We'll share and post all these in the, in the chat, but just really quick, I'll go back. Uh, that is a great question and I will check with teen line whether or not they have supports for deaf or hard of hearing individuals. If you're looking for more information or looking for a website to incorporate, uh, this is Suicide is Preventable from the Nova Science Campaign. If you contact me, we can even give you a code to embed this on your district's website so you have a full best practice, safe and effective messaging on your district or school site with that, without them ever having to leave. Uh, underneath it, you can put information on referral processes, contact information, and through Nova Science, we also have a number of materials that have been created uh, for diverse populations that have not just been translated but culturally adapted. Uh, so I encourage you to check out Know the Signs, Suicide is Preventable, uh, Each Mind Matters and the Each Mind Matters resource, or, uh, resource Center where you can find all of the resources that have been shared under the Each Mind Matters umbrella. Again, once I'm done talking, I'll go ahead and type all these resources into the chat so everybody has a list and you'll also be getting a list of these as we go. And here is my email. I do wanna preface um, contacting me with this one note, which is that I am not a crisis counselor. Um, also, you'll see that this is an email, not a phone number. So if you're in crisis or supporting somebody through a crisis, please contact the National Lifeline Crisis Text Line or your local crisis center. If you're interested in learning more about any of the content I covered, interested in trainings for your district or in your community, uh, you're welcome to reach out for me. Uh, with that, I think I got about 30 seconds. so. I wanna close out by saying thank you for your attention and your time. I know I threw a lot of information at you. I'm gonna come back this afternoon on a much more positive uh, preventative note to talk about messaging and how to find the, the hero in each of us, the role that each of us can play in suicide prevention. 
Uh, but in closing, I think that educators are the chosen people. Thank you for what you do for our kiddos every day. And thank you for your time today. So Sergio, back to you.